Austin Tech Connect is the official podcast of the Austin Technology Council. Founded in 1992, ATC exists to help unite the local technology ecosystem and to encourage the spread of community, collaboration, and conversations in Central Texas. This podcast is sponsored by SailPoint. They are a leading provider of identity security for the modern enterprise, empowering organizations worldwide to put identity security at the core of their business. With a foundation of artificial intelligence and machine learning, SailPoint Identity Security delivers the right access to the right identities and resources at the right time. Now, here is this week's episode. Welcome to Austin Tech Connect the podcast about the future of Austin's technology community. My name's Tom Singer, and I am with the Austin Technology Council. And every single week, we try to bring interviews to this podcast where we can expose you to cool people who are doing innovative things in the world of technology here in Austin. And today, we're gonna take a little little left turn. We're gonna talk about entertainment tech because, you know, we, we hear a lot about the med tech business. We hear a lot about FinTech. We hear a lot about software. But, you know, there's this whole little patch of things happening around the entertainment industry, be it music, be it film, etc. here in Austin. And I've recently run across Nate Strayer, and he is the founder and CEO of Stray Vista. And what Stray Vista does, it is Texas's largest virtual production LED volume studio. Yeah, everybody, I didn't know what that meant either. So we're going to jump into that. Hey, Nate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate the uh, opportunity to chat with you. Absolutely. So for those of you who don't know Nate, Nate is a film producer and a director, and he is really passionate about virtual production. In fact, he's one of the leaders in the industry. So, you know, people get excited when you say, wow, you know, a movie producer. Yeah, kind of. And so he's going to tell us all about what he does and how he does it. But, you know, he's his hobby is this production stuff. He loves what he does around creating movies and commercials and other things that they do there at the studio. But he also admits he is a surfer. But living in the Austin area, I don't think he gets to surf very much anymore. But he grew up in Michigan. He went to college in Florida. He did a little bit of time in Los Angeles, California. And like everyone else in California, he found his way to Austin. You know, I moved here 32 years ago before it was trendy for people in California to move to Austin. And someone told me the other day, they go, you left the door open 33 years ago and everybody followed. So uh, Nate is one of those people who followed. So Nate, let's talk a little bit about your background, right? What what did you go to school for? What did you study before you started doing what you're doing? Yeah, so um, right out of high school, went to Full Sail University, uh, which is a film art art school. My focus was in film, so I was uh, going there for a focus on directing. Um, it's a 20 month program, uh, accelerated bachelor's degree. It took me, I think 30, cause I dropped out for a little bit there, tried to figure out what to do with my life, went back, finished the degree, um, finished strong, went out to LA and started directing mostly music videos. Um, so from, from college, you know, a lot of short film experience doing some music videos at college to LA. I ended up on Instagram DMing every artist I could find that lived in L.A. saying, hey, I just moved here. I'm a music video director. Terrible approach, but uh, two or three people answered that had uh, budgets attached to their projects. And one of them invited me out to be a production assistant, not a director. Um, So the lowest in the in the production, (laughs) super important job. But in terms of power, you know, you don't have any. Um, And so I went out. I did that made a relationship with this guy after a couple of different music videos. Um, his, the director that he'd been working with on the past couple of videos uh, decided to move somewhere else and, and do something else. And he gave me an opportunity, like we'll give you one of the smaller videos. Let's see how you do. And from there just kind of grew the the music video. Uh, like, like they gave you not the one they thought was going to be the, the hit song, but one of the other songs on the album, right? Exactly. So from there, just, yeah, from then on, I was able to say I, I am a director um, and worked out there on, again, mostly music videos till COVID. And then during that time, during the lockdowns, went to Michigan, did my first feature film, ended up selling that. And then after that, realized I don't really need to be in L.A. if the biggest thing in my career happened in Michigan. In Michigan. <laughs> so, uh, looked around, shopped around different cities and uh, looked at Nashville, Miami, um, Austin, obviously, and Las Vegas and decided that uh, Austin was the place I wanted to to move to. And from there, just kind of snowballed with uh, with what we're doing now here at the studio. 
So I, I want to back up to part of your story that, that, that you said. Yeah. Two things. The first thing is, like, you just started just DMing people on, on Instagram and, and telling them, hey, I, hey, I do this. You know, what, what was that like? Because a lot of people are too shy or they think, oh, that'll never work or, or whatever. I mean, what was it like to just coldly reach out to the music industry and be like, hey, hey. Yeah, well, I think it was an interesting time because – I think during that time, it was a little bit more likely that people would check an an Instagram DM than it is now. But um, yeah, it's not fun moving to L.A., wanting to make movies uh, or or direct anything, whether it's music videos or movies or commercials. It's just not easy because so many people want to be doing it. It's a job that people pay money to do. So getting people to pay you money to do it is is a tough thing to do. Um, So... I think my approach was just music videos seem like um, there's enough art, there's enough going on in LA, enough of these music artists moved out here with the same goal that I did and they need somebody to help them on the, on the video side. So let me reach out to these uh, middle mid to lower tier artists um, in terms of popularity and and just see what we can do. But it, I mean, like I said, I sent a couple hundred and and maybe two of them answered and one of them worked out. So it's, Throwing, throwing darts at the dartboard and maybe one of them sticks type of thing. <laughs> That's awesome. And then the question I have to ask is, did you direct anything for anybody who we're going to know, like off, off the top? Um, in LA, probably not off the top. I did a, I did a music video for Bella Thorne. She was a, um, a Disney Channel star um, that also does music. Cool. But yeah, there was a couple different ones that I crewed on in terms of directing. It was mostly those uh, lesser known artists. Nice, nice. That's awesome. All right. So let's fast forward a little bit to, you know, you you, you looked around, you looked at all these cities. What made you pick Austin during the pandemic is I'm going to go open a studio there. Yeah, I think, well, there was a popular trend during COVID to move to Austin. <laughs> um, yeah. So yes, yes, so there was. <laughs> So all those places that people were leaving LA for were kind of open to me to to check out. I understood completely. It wasn't a question of why are people leaving LA? I think um not I think the city is great. I think that it it's it was a stepping stone, a place I needed to be, but in terms of settling down, buying a house, it's just unrealistic because of pricing and, and things like that. So no real hate towards LA, just more I wanna I wanna set up my life somewhere else. Um, and all the things that check the boxes, I'm a big music fan. So Nashville and Austin were two places I was looking at. And to me, Austin just felt a little bit more, um, the people that are playing the live music are people that you'll see out at the bar later in Nashville. It it feels a little bit more, um, starstruck. Like those people are, you're not going to just run into them on the street, but in Austin, everybody's playing music and and there's like a a community feel here where everybody knows everybody, small town sort of thing. Um, so I really, I like that. I like that a lot. And then the, uh, the entertainment industry here is, is growing. You know, you have Robert Rodriguez has a studio here. Linklater's always been here. Um, different, uh, fear the walking dead was shot here. Walker shot here. So just enough film projects, enough TV projects where it, it made sense to live here. And then, um, We'll get into it later, but commercials are also bread and butter of a lot of artists out here. And uh, there's a massive amount of companies who are here. Dell and these other technology companies that that we work with a lot um, are all based out of here. So there was there was a number of things, personal and professional, that led me to Austin. Nice. So let's talk then about Stray Vista. Obviously, you know, your last name is Strayer, so I know where Stray comes from. Uh, why Stray Vista? Good question. Um so there's a school, uh, a college called Strayer University, and they took Strayer Studios, which was originally from high school until they basically sent me a letter saying we own this. Uh, that was what I was operating under. Um, and then when we got formal, I got investors and, and we were growing this multimillion dollar business. It was, okay, we need to we need to come up with an actual brand and actual name. So the property that I originally acquired to set up the studio had a beautiful view and uh, Vista means view. You, so awesome. Like, awesome. That's great. So you are the largest, um, virtual production led volume studio. I said in the introduction, most people, myself included, don't know what that means. So what is a, uh, virtual production led volume studio and, and why is that the direction you went with what you set up? 
Yeah. So virtual production. Um, have you seen the Mandalorian? Oh my God. The- I love, I love the Mandalorian. Okay, so The Mandalorian popularized this way of filming that is innovative. It's a new technology. It's combining three different industries together with events, video games, and film. And basically what you're doing is you're taking what used to be left to green screen, um, which would happen over the course of months, sometimes years after something is shot, and you are now having that happen live on set. So with LED screens, basically what used to be green screened out is now being projected, projected, it's LEDs, not projectors, but Mm -hmm. projected onto these massive walls so that reflections are are being captured live. The everything's happening in camera. It's not a it's not a process where you need to send it off to a VFX artist and have them work and comp everything out. It's all happening live in uh, in studio. So that's what's the Mandalorian pop- popularized by basically linking up your camera with a digital camera inside of a video game engine. The reason we use video game engines is because they render in real time, um, which makes it super fast and we don't have to wait for rendering. Um, and then all of that is displayed on the the volume or the LED, uh, the LED wall, which again is linked to both cameras. So as you move your physical camera, the perspective on the wall is moving as well. Fascinating. Well, the, the way it was described to me by the person who introduced me to you was he said we were sitting, he and I were sitting in a coffee shop and he said, if, if we were going to be in a movie or a TV commercial where we were sitting in a coffee shop, having a conversation, he's like, the chair we're sitting on would be here. The table we're sitting here would be on. And he goes, there would be flooring right here in the foreground. And then it would back up to a giant led wall. And he was pointing to the like coffee shop where the barista was and everything else. He goes, all of that would be done through you know, the, the multiple cameras and the video game engine and all that so that, you know, they could pan us talking and the background would move along with it. And he said, but it's just a screen. So you need a little bit of props right here. And then everything else is done behind you. And then he explained that that's the way the Mandalorian was shot. So exactly. Yeah. It's, uh, there's that scene in the new Batman movie. I'm not sure if you saw that one with Robert Pattinson, but, uh, they cut back to it quite a few times where they're in like, a. a unfinished skyscraper and it's sunset and he's talking to Catwoman or commissioner Gordon and it's just sunset the whole time looking over Gotham, beautiful view. All that was also done in an led volume. So it's, it's good for things like um, time of day. Cause a typical film shoot, you get 30 minutes to get your sunset, to get your sunset. Right. So you film it in the morning during sunrise. If you can, you know, cheat the, the perspective of, of East and West um, for 30 minutes or you shoot at, uh, at, the actual sunset for 30 minutes. And you have to do that over the course of a bunch of days and you waste a bunch of time and it's really stressful. But for something like an LED volume, you get all of that lighting, um, which is reflections and everything um, real time. And you can have that sunset last for however long you want to. Nice. So that's a practical use using an example that everybody knows. Nice. No, that, that, that's, that's fascinating. So as I said, when I did the introduction, you know, one of the things I'm discovering as I, as I talk to people about different technologies and different uses of technologies, both being created here and, you know, because when you talk about video game engines, you know, Austin's one of the leading places for video game development in, in, in the country. So we have an entire video game industry that's going on here. But when we talk about technologies that are being invented here or, or being implemented here for other things, there's a lot going in in kind of the world of what I call sort of entertainment tech. I don't know if that's the right term for it, but there's a lot of things changing in the world of, it, of entertainment. And, and there's some things happening here. What do, what do you see sort of in the world of entertainment tech in Austin? Yeah, I think um, we're definitely a leader in that area with, with virtual production. There are, so for instance, Texas A&M just got um, the green light to build a couple studios like ours. We're doing a, a course with them this summer, um, working with them closely. But uh, this virtual production is interesting because it solves so many problems um, and it can be used for so many different things. So if you need a, a commercial that's, 60 seconds long and you're going to be in six different locations in those 60 seconds rather than taking six days to go to each of those locations you do a virtual production so virtual production is solving all these problems and it's causing all this innovation to happen um, in the tech industry because it's all like i said earlier it's all these different um industries kind of combining together to create this new frankenstein industry of, (laughs) of leds video game engines and film so a lot of the entertainment um, 
tech innovation that I'm seeing, like even go to NAB, which is where the the entertainment tech conference of, of, of the year always is. That we were just there two weeks ago in Vegas. And a lot of it revolves around virtual production, whether that's the workflows and just streamlining those or it's better LED panels or it's new ways to um, to use the LED panels. There's a couple of really cool innovations that I saw this year that we're implementing here at Stray Vista, but it's really um, it's really focused on efficiency. It's focused on being um, able to accomplish really hard tasks without having to go through the hardship, but the results are the same, if not better. Um, is is really what I'm seeing. So there's AI innovations I'm seeing. Generative AI is is obviously a big topic. I think in every industry because people in marketing, even at a, at a large corporation, are looking at it like, can we use this instead of artists? And so there's there's some fear as well um, in it. But what I'm seeing a lot of, and it's partially because I'm in this sp- uh, spot in the industry, but it's a lot of virtual production. It's a lot of AI. It's a lot of these. Uh, video game engine tools that Epic is making with Unreal. But um, it's exciting. It's all it's all very exciting. Motion capture is another one. I'm sure, you know, Avatar and these different Planet of the Apes movies, these different movies that use motion capture. And it's all kind of related. It's the same. It's the same thing. It's uh, being able to be anywhere while you're inside of a soundstage is, is really where where this technology is taking us. Well, I love what you said that it's sort of the industry, you know, is bolting things together. It's sort of like this Frankenstein thing. And I, I got to thinking about that as you said it. It is true because several years ago, we couldn't have giant, essentially TV screens, LED screens that were big enough without seams. You know, it used to be in order to do that, you'd stitch nine television sets together until you'd have the big soup seams down the middle. Now they've got it where these LED screens are the whole wall. So you, you've got that. You've obviously got, you know, the the huge advances in the last decade when it comes to video games and the realistic, realistic uh, motion and stuff that the video games have done, cameras have come a long way because now, you know, you can do so much, you know, more than you ever could, uh, even just with your iPhone camera, but certainly the types of cameras you use, the, the technology has gone a long way. And, you know, with AI and with everything else that it's, it's interesting because I always say that when we can let technologies converge, when we can bring the different slices of technology together, that's where the real magic happens. And one of the things I worry about is we tend to get a little siloed as Austin gets bigger. And, you know, you've got your your fintech people, your medtech people, you've got, uh, uh, you know, software people, you know, you got semiconductor people, you got everybody kind of in their silo and people just want to network with people in their own silo. But the real innovation comes when when things get thrown together. And I love what what's happening in the in the entertainment industry where that's being bolted together. The cool thing, yeah, the cool thing about that is anybody who's interested in entertainment and tech at the same time um, probably thinks of George Lucas as, as one of the first people to to do this. And it really was him, you know, who without him, we wouldn't have Photoshop even. There's, he, he's involved in all the, like the creative Star Wars is also why Pixar exists and why Photoshop exists and all these different things. But it, it really comes down to, I think, a reason that the entertainment industry is so good at Frankensteining these technologies together to to create new things is because everything we do here, everything we do at Stray Vista is in service to a story. So if you if you get a script, if you have a story, if even if it's a commercial, if you have this story that somebody wants to tell, they're they're paying you to tell, you'll find a way to tell that story. And if it means you you take this piece of technology that can do this part, but it can't do this part. And then you have to find a way to glue those together so that it makes sense. Storytelling is really a good way, I think, to push technology in in a good direction where it's implemented and, and combined to be used well. Because at the end of the day, if you're in service to a story rather than a product, you're going to figure out how to make it work. Whether or not it makes sense at the time. Because this technology economically didn't make sense until pretty recently. Right. Well, it is true that, you know, being able to tell your story, people forget is important in everything. I mean, for a tech company, when they're trying to get funding, they have to tell their story. You know, if they want to get customers, they have to tell their story. So story really drives everything. Human beings, we're, we're wired for story. So not just a story that's going to be in your commercial or your movies that you're making, but everything, every time human beings interact, story does drive us. So I like that, that point that, you know, getting the story told is what drives the technology. That makes a lot of sense to me. And and the other thing is, is there was a book, I'm, I'm, I can't remember exactly, but let's call it 18, 20 years ago called, you know, the rise of the creative class. 
and by Richard Florida. And one of the things he said, Austin was the, the poster child for the book, but basically that when you have a huge arts community and you have the technologists, that's where the magic happens. That's where when it can converge. And when I look at all the, the technologists that I know, a lot of them play in bands. A lot of these tech companies have garage bands that they have. And, you know, a lot of them are, a lot of people who work for the tech companies are, are painters or actors or singers or, or whatever it is. And so when, when tech and art can come together, you know, that's, that's, that's a pretty good thing. And of course it's created your whole world, right? Yeah. I think whether or not you're creating art or a product, most people who need to be creative throughout their workday would consider themselves artists. I think if you ask most, most of the engineers and, and people that work with us, what they consider themselves, they wouldn't say, Oh, I'm a computer guy or "Oh, I'm an led tech. They're like, no, I'm an artist. Like I'm helping create art. We're, we're creating, even if, even if their part stops with the technology and they don't go into the, the actual script um, or know what we're shooting, they're creating the art behind the art. So I think, there's a case to be made and there's lots of movies about this that every movie that's ever made could be three movies because you, you could make a movie about the development of that movie. You can make a movie about the making of that movie and then you have the movie itself. Movie itself. <laughs> well, um, and I mean, I, you know, I know somebody who's a mathematician who, you know, is a quant for a hedge fund and I don't know that he uses the words, but in a way he's an artist and you know what he's studying and then creating code, you know, to make the, the trades happen. I mean, it's, it's as much art as it is science. Uh-huh, hundred percent. So we talked earlier about that commercials are kind of the bread and butter for a studio like yours. Let's talk about the different types of projects that that you work on and and who are the clients that you serve? Yeah, we've worked with uh, let me pull up our our uh, deck here. There's so many so many great companies we've worked with in terms of um, commercials. and then uh, bread and butter is is definitely a good way to put it. this is. This is what Austin um, is is really good at doing. Is there's a lot of agencies uh, on either coast that um, the directors, the agencies, the uh, the the companies themselves will be like, we want to do this commercial in Austin, Texas, because if we're gonna have to travel somewhere and and shoot this thing, we want to we want it to be in a place we we love visiting. And Austin seems to be one of those those great places. So I mean, we've worked with Starbucks, we've worked with Sega. Dell, AMD, Cadillac, Google, Intel, um, University of Texas, the Air Force, Alienware, um, a number of different music artists have come through, shot their music videos here. Um, Los Lonely Boys is, is a big Texas artist, as well as Shane Smith and the Saints came through. Uh, Paul Wall, Danny Brown. So a bunch of different, uh, really cool opportunities between music, commercial, um, and uh, narrative film as well. Interesting. So as we look at this idea of, you know, entertainment tech, what do you think is the future for Austin when it comes to that? I mean, obviously, you know, we're, we're, we're ahead, a huge tech innovation center, but, but in this world of entertainment tech, and I, I think it's going to do nothing but grow. Does Austin get to play in that pool be, beyond just what you're doing? Yeah. So there is a last year we got a historic amount of, um, film and it, they're they're not the same as the incentives in other states but for lack of a better term film incentives here in texas so the way that texas works with these incentives and just in, in case anybody isn't aware of the way that the entertainment industry typically works with productions is if a location doesn't have some sort of uh competitive incentive that say georgia or la or some of these other states have it just doesn't financially make sense to shoot there so luckily um texas has been moving in a direction of becoming extremely competitive and i believe at this point we are um extremely competitive um we got historic funding to our um our uh, it's called TMIP, which is a fund that can go back into um, incentivizing these productions to be here. So last year, for the next two years, we have two hundred million dollars that uh, was awarded to that TMIP program, and uh, it makes us incredibly competitive to bring shows here and movies here. Taylor Sheridan films a lot of his things here. There's uh, that show called The Chosen, um, which films here. It's a started as a crowdfunded uh, TV show about the life of Jesus, massive show. And uh, that films here in Texas, like I said earlier, Robert Rodriguez, Linklater, a lot of these artists are, are moving here. And you'd be surprised at how many um, are studios just outside of Austin and Dripping Springs. Um, and the amount of producers that if I if I listed off 
the names of you might not you might know them and if i listed off the projects they worked on you definitely know them they live here they live in dripping springs and they want to work here and uh they're finally starting to be able to bring projects here because of those incentives so i think as we move forward there's a huge push of uh explaining to the taxpayer explaining to the representatives of the taxpayer the benefits of having entertainment in your city whether that's the benefit of simply to put together a production the amount of jobs that you are um, creating is astronomical the amount of money that you're spending that actually ends up on the screen is a lot of times a lot lower than the amount of money that is spent to take care of the crew, which means caterers, which means local hotels, which means all these things that go into the actual community that you're shooting this film in. So Texas is starting to realize that. And it really starts there. It starts with being able to be competitive and then um, those productions coming, bringing in that cash that allows us to, to really innovate. So commercials are, are great. They, they also use this, um, uh, this incentive budget, but um, without those narrative projects that really push the limits, because those are, you know, a hundred to $500 million budget movies. That's when you're really able to create new technology. That's when you're really able to innovate because you've got this problem that needs to be solved and the return needs to be that one movie. So you can create this thing that doesn't need to be like virtual production. Isn't this, isn't a product that can be manufactured. It's, you know, it's a, it's a put together way of filming that um, one movie needs to hit to, to kind of pay it off. And that's how we got to the point where it's now more affordable and used in commercials and stuff. So the innovation comes with uh, the money as in any industry. And that money is coming to Texas now that uh, the taxpayer and those representatives are seeing the benefits. Sure. What do you wish that the tech community in general in Austin knew about the entertainment and movie industry in, in central Texas? What, what do you think you wish everybody knew? I think that um, it can kind of like you used the word siloed earlier. Entertainment can kind of feel siloed from the rest of um, other industries. But really, we we want to use any innovation of any sort in, in tech is eventually brought to film in some way. So I think um, kind of having that be a two way street where where we're um, implementing new innovations from uh, the, again the camera world it it all goes into film right computers cameras it's all it's all uh, connected so for me in Austin I feel like um, just connecting with these with these uh, these innovators these these players you know VR is another big one there's a, a lot of big VR companies Meta has a big uh, presence here. We're all using the same tools. So figuring out how to uh, kind of work together to streamline those tools in a way where it makes sense for everybody is really exciting and it's nice. happening. Nice. So I ask everybody before we end the podcast, so I'm a big believer in these three words. I think that when these three words work together, we solve all problems. And that is community, collaboration, and conversations. So when I say community, collaboration, and conversations, which one of those words jumps out at you the most and why? Uh, community probably, um, especially being here in Texas from coming from a place, uh, like LA where everybody is doing the same thing, but you don't know any of them to a place where anybody who's in the entertainment industry, we probably know each other's names. I've probably shaken their hands. They probably shot here in our studio. So community, especially in Austin is, uh, is a huge highlight of, of being able to operate here. Um, knowing the industry players, knowing that we are all on the same path. We're all on the same goal, you know, rising tide lifts all ships sort of thing. There's studios that have announced that will technically be our competition, but uh, they call us up for advice and we help them because the more infrastructure we have, the more we can, we can handle and take care of. If they find a new way to do something that makes our lives easier, they'll share it with us. We'll do the same for them. Um, so that community and I guess that ties into collaboration. Yeah, and no, that's great. Obviously, to have that community, you need to have a lot of conversations. So they all do, but community is huge. Nice. So last question. If one of your high school buddies from Michigan was coming to Austin for the first time, never been here, where would you take them to show them why Austin's cool? Man, probably Lake Austin. Probably take them uh, wake surfing on Lake Austin. Nice. Barton Spring, cool. Um but yeah, Lake Austin is beautiful. Yep. Awesome. I, just, I think that's the first time anybody has said wake surfing on Lake Austin. That's good. I like that. <laughs> so any last words for us, Nate? Um, 
I don't know. Yeah. I mean, check out virtual production, check out uh, the behind the scenes. If you want to know more about what we do behind the scenes of the Mandalorian, uh, you can just YouTube that it's super interesting stuff. It's hard to explain without a visual, but once you see that visual, it, uh, it will kind of get your gears turning of how this innovation can really help create new, uh, new stories, tell stories in a new way. Yeah, I got really excited when 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 I learned about it from from a friend of mine, and I was kind of doing a little research, and he introduced me to you, and I think that was that was great. And I would love to see you know the the technology side of entertainment that, that's here in Austin. We'd love to see them get involved with the greater tech community instead of being siloed off on the side. Get involved with the Austin Technology Council or some other group that is serving our tech community, because when we when we bring smart, innovative people together, that's where the magic happens, as we know. So, Nate, thank you so much for being a guest here on the show. Thank you, Tom. Hey, and thanks to everybody who tuned in and listened. You know what? If it wasn't for all of you, why would we do these interviews? So thank you very much. Make sure you tell all of your friends and all your coworkers about Austin Tech Connect. We bring you an interview every single week, and we'll be back next week with somebody just as cool as Nate. I know you're thinking, how will you find somebody as cool as Nate? But but we will. We'll work, we'll work hard to find somebody just that cool. And make sure that your company is supporting the Austin Technology Council. You know, we're a 32-year-old organization, but we're looking for where do we go for the next decade, and we can't do it alone. We need the most civic-minded, visionary entrepreneurs to help get involved and help us find what that future looks like. So make sure that you've joined the Austin Technology Council and you're supporting what we're trying to do for the future. Thanks for listening to the Austin Tech Connect podcast. Make sure your company is a member of the Austin Technology Council and add your voice to the future of our tech ecosystem in Central Texas. 